happiness I don't understand. No other computer contains as much recorded knowledge as yours. Not fair! A man has value! A man has worth! The too often, man becomes clever instead of becoming wise. He becomes inventive, but not thoughtful. And sometimes, as in the case of Mr. Whipple, he can create himself right out of existence. Tonight's tale of oddness and obsolescence from the Twilight Zone. Look, I'm not against AI at all. I'm a futurist. I love this stuff. But the sheer amount of fear I've seen spill over the internet in the past few weeks made me want to make this video. I've had dozens of separate conversations with professionals across many fields, including visual effects, CGI, game development, business, science. And from these conversations, I've come to the conclusion that you can chill, that I can chill, that we can chill. AI isn't coming after our jobs yet. But I'll get to that later. I have to add that all opinions are my own and speculative. I'm just providing ideas and trying to inspire discussion on the topics of AI and ChatGPT and what it means for the future of work. But first, let's think of the big picture. An idea that we unfortunately inject ourselves with is technological determinism. In a nutshell, what it means is that technology evolves naturally over time and there's nothing we can do about it except adapt to it. But that's not true. The vast majority of startups fail. Timing, culture, legislation, it all impacts how technology transforms society. It's a back and forth debate, a team sport. Technology is made by humans. We can't forget that. AI is not always reliable. Because of its exclusive self-checking features, Univac cannot make a mistake. AI has transformed over the past 50 years in crazy ways, all the way from logic-based systems that went from if-then statements to sophisticated neural networks. But despite the advances, AI isn't always reliable. It makes mistakes. For example, in the first recorded incident of a fatal self-driving car crash, the AI had difficulty classifying the human from the bicycle they were walking with. Switching classification between vehicle or bike or human, the unreliable labeling and an additional issue in the alert system led to someone's death. This isn't the only example of an accident like this, but it reminds us that AI isn't perfect. And I'm not saying let's not have self-driving cars. I think in the long run, it will probably be safer than distracted human drivers, but they're not perfect because AI also makes mistakes. ChatGPT can also get things wrong. In fact, Stack Overflow, the mecca for coders that look for answers to their programming woes, banned ChatGPT code solutions because they can be factually inconsistent. But the idea is that AI or ChatGPT or any language model isn't always going to be reliable. And this is gonna take time to fix. It's going to require more data and probably some humans in the pipeline. Future use of UNIVAC may give us faster and more accurate weather predictions than were ever possible before. Just because that guy at work speaks over you very confidently doesn't mean he is right. Accuracy and precision are very different things. The best way to think about it is with a target. You can shoot arrows and hit completely off the target, but they can be clustered. That's precision. Your shots are consistent and put together. Accuracy is when you're actually hitting the target to some degree. And if you know statistics, precision is about how spread out your data are, and accuracy is about the average of your data. What you want is to have both accuracy and precision. Right now, when we use some language models like ChatGPT, we get the illusion that things are accurate and precise because it's so eloquent. It's just precise and convincing, but not necessarily accurate. There are many examples of this online with code that looks right, but isn't. With information about a particular subject, but isn't. Problem three, trust and issues of bias in AI. A big problem with AI that has been around for a while is bias. 
When AI is trained with biased data, it will undoubtedly lead to biased outputs. Famous examples of AI bias include how Google and Facebook's image recognition systems misclassify people with darker skin tones as animals. Amazon's automated hiring algorithms ended up only selecting men. And predictive policing systems sent police officers to neighborhoods primarily made up of racial minorities. ChatGPT is also guilty of bias, with plenty of examples to spare. With improvements potentially happening, while making AI models more interpretable and less biased is an active area of research and activism, with books getting published on the subject, including an excellent one from one of my brothers, there's still much work to be done. In news and writing, we might start asking ourselves, who wrote it? And will it actually matter if the information is accurate, even if it was fully written by AI, or even assisted by AI? These powerful AI tools, ChatGPT, DALL-E, Midjourney, etc., all of them are trained on massive amounts of data scraped from the internet. That's why they are able to do so much. They learn from the work of millions of people. Recently, issues about the copyright of the data have begun to appear on the news. Is it fair to train AI on data from an artist's work without their permission? Some artists that found their style in generative art don't think so. But this also begs the question, don't we all use references or derive inspiration from other artists too? In essence, this is what the AI is doing, right? It's complicated. If Taylor Swift one day decided that she didn't want to have her music included in the training data, does that mean that AI couldn't generate music that sounded like her music? No, not really, because there are artists performing covers or making music inspired by her style that would enter into the training data, effectively circumventing her desires to be left out. This is true for visual art and for writing too. DeviantArt and ArtStation, among other places, have started to include HTML tags attached to the metadata of an image that indicates whether the piece can or cannot be used for AI. This policy follows from a massive digital protest from ArtStation artists that began to post no AI icons all over the site. Stable Diffusion is now allowing artists to opt out from training and OpenAI, the creators of ChatGPT and DALL-E are also working on encrypting GPT outputs with secret fingerprints. This information in today's age is so abundant, so this encryption effort will pay off long term and will help hamper the potential misuse of ChatGPT or any AI. But again, there will always be potentially other platforms that may or may not follow the ethical standards. So who is accountable when the AI gets it wrong? The thing is, yes, humans also make mistakes, and yes, humans can think they are extremely right when they are completely wrong. But humans can, for the most part, be made accountable. We can't really make AI accountable. How? Do we blame the company? Do we blame the software engineers? Do we blame the robot and send it to court? I don't know, it's a, it's a hard problem. Accountability is important and it actually provides incentives for how to operate peaceably in the society. I think private companies have to be cognizant of the impact their AI can have on the world, both positive and negative. And IBM seems to think so too. In their AI ethics page, they believe that the designers, developers, and the company itself are accountable for the AI. But when push comes to shove, what does this mean practically? This might be something that governments need to decide. The issue of accountability means that humans will probably always be in the loop, or at least they should be. High stake jobs that could put people in danger or could negatively impact society will require some humans in the loop, even when the AI is 99% confident about something. This includes construction, highly scalable software like ChatGPT, medicine, and law. That's a good thing. And that also means that there will be jobs for humans. Change your made by men for man to benefit and progress. 
But when man ceases to control the products of his ingenuity and imagination, he not only risks losing the benefit, but he takes a long and unpredictable step into, into twilight zone. It's hard to really imagine what the world is going to be like in a few years. We are at exponential technological growth. So I think the first thing that we need to really do is reframe AI from being a replacement mechanism to a tool. AI doesn't replace jobs, it replaces tasks, which to some extent often means the consolidation of some jobs, where one individual can now perform multiple tasks. MIT AI ethicist Kate Darling puts it best. The way that historically we've treated a lot of animals like tools, like you say, or tools and, or products, and then some of them we've treated as companions. And so we're starting to see very similar buckets with robots where there are some that we treat strictly as tools or strictly as products. Robots can be like animals have been for thousands of years, products, partners, and companions, not enemies. Humans, we are predictive organisms. We develop knowledge over our lifetime and use it to make sense of the world. When we learn something, we need feedback to tell us whether we are up to something good or if we are getting it wrong. Getting that feedback can be slow. Sometimes we have to wait for the teacher to grade our paper or we have to wait for code to compile to see if it works. ChatGPT and other language models give us feedback faster. That means that we will learn faster. AI like ChatGPT spreads power and lowers the barrier of entry. Now, someone that just started learning something can get to a medium skill level faster. This is good for knowledge that has been reserved for a select few. Automatic bank tellers, aka ATMs, are a form of automation that spread access to money outside of banking hours. Some people fear that it would take away jobs, but that actually didn't happen. In fact, bank teller jobs went up. Not all automated jobs remove the jobs they automate. What happened here is that because it became cheaper to operate branches of banks, the banks were able to open up more, and in opening up more, they ended up hiring more bank tellers, despite the growing proliferation of ATMs. Now, with digital banking far past the physical ATM, teller jobs are still estimated to go down eventually. And to be fair, I looked for articles to see how much pushback the rise of ATMs was causing. And while I didn't look that deep, I did find an article suggesting bank tellers were happy with ATMs as it made their jobs easier. I also think that the ATM example I gave suffers from survival bias. It's a specific example in which automation didn't hurt the job it was automating. However, the fear of automation has been around for decades. And it is true that a lot of jobs did disappear, not completely, but quite significantly. The lesson here, though, is that not all automation is replacement. Some automation, like the ATMs, was complementary. Can AI be complementary to your job? Now, I've seen people start using ChatGPT for their art, for their writing, for their research, and as a supplement to Google. These are highly skilled individuals who are leveraging it to free up their time. We should do this too for whatever AI we find that's useful for our needs. We should let it do the grunt work for us so that we can have more time to spend with family or to do the things that matter more to us outside of work. Value is inherently going to change. What would take a professional artist hours now takes someone with some semblance of an artistic eye seconds. Does that mean that art is going to become less valuable? I think what we consider valuable will change because AI lowers the barrier of entry, products of what we currently consider low and medium quality will heavily decrease because there will be many more of them, while products of high quality will increase. Although this will also change when we begin to rescale our expectations. Which brings me to the next section.
We are constantly rescaling our expectations of what's possible and what isn't possible. Who here remembers the transition of 2D sprites to 3D objects in the 90s? Games like Doom, Tomb Raider, Quake, GoldenEye 64 were killing it in graphics. When these games popped up, the graphics were insane. Things looked so real. But over time, we rescaled our expectations about what looks real. Graphics are better than ever now. I mean, look at games like Cyberpunk. Innovation in technology allows us to rescale our expectations. When we rescale, new things are possible. And we get a new but blurry idea of what's possible. We did this for games. We did this for movies. Two, one. We did this when landing on the moon. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. And we will do this with AI. When we rescale our expectations, there's room for opportunity, new ideas, and new jobs. There are some arguments to be made that we are in the middle of the creative economy, which is defined by individuals or groups of people that leverage their creativity and their passions to produce goods and services, including photography, writing, art, and video, amongst other things. In fact, in the study by Adobe, over 160 million people joined the global creator economy in the past two years. This rise in creators and the advances in AI might exponentially increase the output of creative work, and the need for novelty will potentially lead to the rise of the experience economy. This is where opportunities for human connection and immersive technology like AR or VR stand out, because an immersive or mixed reality experience is inherently more visceral than a purely visual or oral one. Thus, this is another sector for new ideas, new art, and new jobs. Because AI is trained in all the data it can find across the internet, information that is kept inside the gates of private companies won't be easily accessible to the AI. This means that they will have the gatekeeper advantage. While this may encourage private companies to become even more secretive, there is an exponentially growing culture for open source knowledge. In fact, that's what most language models are trained on. If you're an expert in a particular subject, you have a temporary advantage because it is you who will be able to fine tune these models to specialize in the particular subject. It's interesting because companies will seek to find experts to fine tune the AI that may eventually remove the expert from the equation. This is paradoxical, but this could also mean that for these experts, their salaries will increase by a lot in order to offset the future costs. So what about the government and the policies over AI? We all know that governments can be slow to act. Crypto laws were slow to appear, and then when they did appear, there was still a lot of confusion, in part because legislation tends to fall behind innovation. Lack of regulatory efficiency that uses these analog laws to apply to the evolving technology today. With AI, it's no different. Whispers about right to work laws have begun to permeate the internet. Is it a fundamental right for citizens of a society to be able to find jobs? Is there such a thing as a post-work society? The author of Arrival wisely states that the fear of AI isn't about the technology itself, but about capitalism. I tend to think that most fears about AI are best understood as fears about capitalism. And I think that this is actually true of most fears of technology, too. Most of our fears or anxieties about technology are best understood as fears or anxiety about how capitalism will use technology against us. So post-work society, where there's a universal basic income and where work may be reserved for the essential and the voluntary, is probably far from near. But that doesn't mean that we can't have a say about how AI will transform our lives. And maybe that means that the way governance operates will also need to change.
For a human, what is meaningful? Where do we find purpose? I think Marie Kondo has it right. We need to begin to ask ourselves, what sparks joy? Do we want to define our life over our work? I find a lot of purpose in the work that I do as a researcher, but should purpose be condensed into a single job? According to a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research, automation has caused a 50 to 70% decrease in wages since 1980, potentially increasing the income inequality gap. With AI potentially replacing both service and knowledge-related work, does that mean we will have less contact with people? Will we lose the human touch? I don't think so. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we were all itching for human contact. AI can actually enhance that, and maybe in ways that we least expected. Despite Amazon's success, the world's largest retail on the internet with more than 16 million customers, the end of borders, the 40-year-old company was unable to find a buyer willing to pull it out of bankruptcy, small bookstores, and the rise of e-books, bookstores are still around. And a 2016 survey showed that 65% of US citizens prefer physical books as opposed to e-books. True, bookstores are slowly declining, but slower than it seems. And if you think that the trend will change because it's only older generations that read books, well, that may not be true. In a 2021 survey, about 80% of people in the US between the ages of 18 to 29 have read at least one book in any format that year. Places like bookstores, parks, and museums might actually rise in popularity when AI proliferates deeper into society. I think the value of social contact will increase despite remote work, AI, and general automation. There may be a cultural shift in how and what it is we do to create spaces for social interaction. This rise in social value will be part of what paves the way for immersive technology in both AR and VR. And if you're wondering what will happen to your job and you're looking where can you take your skill sets, well, there's an entire budding ecosystem all revolving around AR and VR. New jobs and new forms of entertainment and connection are what the XR community is trying really hard to foster and with many of those efforts being placed in how to do this ethically. Try not to be dissuaded by the overhype of the metaverse. AR and VR and the immersive tech in general, there's something there. And if AI is to cause a cultural shift that requires transforming how we define purpose and meaning, we can begin to ideate. What kind of jobs enhance purpose and meaning? What kind of jobs will do that for you and for others? That's where we can leverage AI and get a job doing so. What I say now is for the now. In a few months, there could be a huge, significant technological change. Researchers are looking for new and better models, and when that happens, who knows? I guess we will have to rescale our expectations again. AI has the potential of being incredibly enhanced. It will speed up workflows, open up time for things that matter, while also making things that matter funner and easier. When you start thinking about ways to deal with the change instead of fearing it. This will open up our eyes to the opportunities that come with it. And most importantly, we have to remind ourselves that we make the technology. The technology does not make us.